back again. Um, so um, Irenaeus, uh, the idea of recapitulation then would be, uh, I always think of the phrase like gathering up. Um, it's gathering together, gathering up um, all things, uh, the language of the New Testament really, of um, Christ as the one who recapitulates or uh, 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 restates the theme. The term recapitulation is used in music, in sonatas, for a musical theme that's at the beginning and then uh, returns in you know some obvious dramatic way later in the in the composition. And of course, in this regard, then uh, recapitulation um, certainly for Irenaeus uh, was based on. Jesus as uh, the new Adam, or or as Paul also says, the last Adam. Um, um, when he uses the word last, you should probably think like ultimate, or even the word like eschatological, like Jesus is the embodiment of the age to come and of true human nature, we'll say like at its best. And because of that, and because human beings are so deeply intertwined in creation, uh, then Jesus, as the human being at human nature's best, will um, have an effect, basically, of like sort of like seeping in uh, through all things and in this love divine, drawing all things uh, to God. That's a beginning way of thinking about recapitulation. Now, um, what I do in this reading is um, try to, it's actually a nice background to what, what uh, Johnson's arguing for, which is um, I'm trying to show that while what she's writing is solid Christian theology, it was a hard won, hard earned Christian theology as, uh, as the church and, and Christian thinkers and pastors, writers, priests struggled with the question of what is, what's Jesus like? Like, who who and what was this figure? And um, I know it's in your reading, so I won't, uh, but I do want to hit the main points. Um, I talk about Irenaeus because in the second century, Irenaeus is the main figure who opposed uh, Gnostic Christologies that uh, uh, generally if not all, uh, you know, entirely, rejected the idea of Jesus being physical, that there was a real physical body that was subject to suffering and death. And um, Irenaeus, and then another guy that I mentioned, uh, also from the second century, whose name also starts with an I, Ignatius, um, are the two great champions of arguing, and other people did too, but um, certainly in this book and for my purposes, Irenaeus is the main one, and then Ignatius is also somebody that championed uh, the deep and real physicality of Jesus, so that you have, first of all, a real connection with bodily existence, material existence, with this incarnation. You see, the, the part of the point would be you can't have a deep incarnation of the divine Logos, if the body that's entailed in the incarnation isn't a real body and a body incapable of suffering and all of that. So I love the quotation from Irenaeus on page 78. I won't read it for you here, but uh, you see it there. It's one of actually one of my favorite quotations in uh, all of Christian history. I also love the one right across the page on 79, uh, drawing from Ignatius. By the way, Ignatius was on his way to his martyrdom as he wrote seven letters. Coco, lie down. Baby, lie down. Here's my fellow creature sharing in uh, the realm of the flesh who's also being quite recalcitrant toward, um, I won't say her master. Yeah, neither will she. Um, but her human friend. Right, baby? Such a pretty girl. Pretty eyes. Just, just relax. Relax for daddy. So then, uh, so that was settled really uh, through 
the writings of theologians in the second century uh, and the Gnostic um, denial of Jesus' body was rejected as heterodox and um, and that and I love that Ignatius connected this uh, rejection of Jesus' physicality with the rejection of uh, people in physical uh, you know um, vulnerability widows, orphans, of the afflicted, the prisoner, the hungry and thirsty. Um, that's all on page 79. I hope you'll notice that. I really like that. Uh, the next step happens in the 4th century, uh, largely uh, with this wonderful theologian who's actually called Gregory the Theologian, Gregory of Nazianzus. He's called that in the Eastern tradition, at least, of Christianity. Hey, get out of there. Get out of there. Get out of the garbage. Oh, stop it. What am I going to do about this doggy? What am I going to do with you? What am I going to do with you? Uh, Gregory of Nazianzus uh, opposed uh, the proposals of a fellow named Apollinaris, whose heresy is still with us so often. In fact, in another one of Johnson's books, that lovely little one that I've mentioned in class, Consider Jesus, she uh, quotes the Roman Catholic theologian that she actually also quoted in your reading for today. Um, I don't know that she was ever a student of him. She might have been. She's certainly a student, at least, of his writings. And therefore, if not personally, then a student, we'd say, from afar. Uh, Karl Rahner, R-A-H-N-E-R. -E the one line I can quote from Rahner is a line that's in Johnson's other book. Rotter complained that the ghost of Apollinaris still haunts the church. And Apollinaris's heresy was that while Jesus did have a real body, so that's settled, uh, he didn't have a human experience of, of cognition, that, that they're what they called then a rational soul. We might use the word mind, um, intellect. Um, Apollinaris said that rather than uh, a human cognition or human mind, um, the divine mind, the, the logos basically uh, replaced or absorbed, but more replaced what would have been the human mentality of Jesus. This is horrible because <laughs> uh, it's just another way of denying the incarnation because surely another dimension of um, our existence, certainly as humans in the realm of flesh, is our uh, mental or cognitive uh, capacities. Um, I mentioned in this section that uh, we're, I'm really grateful that Luke uh, actually says to us that Jesus increased in wisdom um, and in stature, size, and in favor with God, which always seems a little surprising, and uh, in favor with other people. Um, Luke actually says this twice, and it seems to be an emphasis on Jesus, I would say, normal human development. I actually cited this uh, that text last Sunday uh, for my little congregation where I was um, preaching on the woman, uh, Syrophoenician or Lebanese woman, who is bothering Jesus and his disciples, and, you know, Jesus first kind of tries to ignore her. Then uh, when that doesn't work, uh, he says, you know, it's not right to give what is for the children to the dogs. And, uh, you know, he seems quite dismissive of her. And finally, she just gets in front of him. Uh, you get the sense that before she was either trailing behind or alongside Jesus' little entourage. But she gets up in front, kneels before him and says, Lord, uh, please heal my child, my daughter. Uh, and when he says, I was only sent for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and it's not right to give to the dogs what is meant for the children, you know her classic answer, ah, but even the dogs, you know, like my dog is right now under my desk. Uh, she likes to get under there by my feet. There's no food, of course, no crumbs are going to fall down there. Maybe they did one time, that's all it takes. But, you know, the dogs camp out for the crumbs. And Mark especially tells us that Jesus really liked her answer. I like to think they went, that's good, that's good. You can go home, your your daughter is healed. 
Uh, but an otherwise kind of troubling passage. And, but if we, as I said to my, uh, my Methodists out there in Hakumba, if we take seriously Jesus' true human intellectual life, which would be part of the incarnation, it's part of the realm of the flesh, uh, would mean that Jesus learned. Uh, and that Jesus uh, learned more or less like we do, that he increased in wisdom, uh, that he didn't know the Hebrew alphabet like from the womb. He had to learn it in synagogue like the other little boys. I don't think the girls were there. I think it was just the little boys. I'm not happy about that, but I think that's the way it was. Um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, why would we think there was a point at which Jesus quit increasing in wisdom? And I like to think, quite possibly, that this uh, encounter with the Lebanese woman, Heather Ross and I have gone round and round about this. She doesn't agree with me. But I like to think that this was a significant turning point. Uh, I'll call it learning experience for Jesus. And all I can tell you is I love, I love a Jesus who is willing to uh, change his mind and learn, be challenged. Uh, more could even be said about this, in, uh, but I'll, I'll save it for another time. And then very quickly, the third uh, happened a couple centuries later with the question of whether or not Jesus exercised human volition. And you, you've read about it, or will read about it, I trust. Uh, but the figure in this case is Maximus the Confessor. He's become one of my favorite theologians. Uh, you'll see how rich his theology is for ecological implications as you read uh, that section that I've given you to read. Um, and uh, he's really become uh, just a renewal of interest in, in this guy as well. Um, and, and what he's arguing for is that Jesus really did experience significant human volition. He had to make choices. He could have chosen otherwise. Um, if not, then his obedience means nothing. Um, you know, uh, using Anselm's theory, Jesus can't satisfy the debt of human obedience if his obedience wasn't a real obedience. And uh, the book of Hebrews is the New Testament document that most strongly emphasizes this idea. Um, I will say, just in, to wrap this up then, part of... A, then we see how the church, and these were all significant struggles, body, uh, cognition or intellect, mind, and then um, volition, choice, were three different uh, controversies that the church engaged in regarding Jesus. And every time, though not easily or immediately, every time the church, I would like to say, came out on the right side of this by, by re- asserting Jesus' true humanity, which is necessary for this idea of an incarnation that really goes deeply into the realm of basar, the flesh. And the other implication that I'm trying to make in that chapter is um, that these are also all dimensions critical to our lives as those creatures created in God's image and uh, critical to our role as ecological caretakers uh, in God's creation. So I hope you'll notice that point as well. Well, I've droned on long enough. Thank you all. Uh, blessings. I'll see you Thursday. I want to see your notes uh, on this before uh, class time on Thursday.